Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, trolls and marks alike, welcome one, welcome all to another episode of Wrestle Magic. Now, if you guys know where I actually pulled that from, you guys are a big YouTube fan, you know what I'm talking about. But anyways, tonight's episode, we are going to be covering somebody who really helped the industry back in the 80s, the Dynamite Kid. And helping me today, and why I keep saying we, somebody who's been a really great influence on me throughout my life, somebody who I have looked up to for a long time, my uncle, my friend, no, not Michael Gross. I'm talking about Six Pack Timothy Gross, his brother. Tim, how are we doing tonight, man? I'm doing good. It's good to see you, Maverick, and uh, that's awful kind of you to uh, put those words that way. Absolutely, man. So let's just dive right into it, man, because I remember you talking to me about this guy as a kid. I didn't know much about him, so I really became an adult and really started looking into this dark history of this guy, but also some light parts to it. But yeah, so let's get into it. We are going to talk tonight about the Dynamite Kid. Definitely a, a polarizing figure. You have a guy that he's done just about everything as far as tag team wrestling and, and innovating. And then at the same time, too, on the other end of the spectrum, he's done some, uh, well, allegedly done some pretty dark things. Agreed. As well as paving the way for those like Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, mm-hmm. Jushin Thunder Absolutely. Liger, and many others. He's known for some terrible things as well as some great things. I mean, he was kind of one of those guys who proved you don't have to be Hogan, Cena, and The Rock size to really show great skill set. And that is something that I feel is really admirable to do when you're, you know, not the biggest guy. You're somebody that almost anybody can look to and say, I kind of want to be like that guy. And it's still an achievable goal as long as you put the work in. He, uh, you know, he's one of those guys that managed to stay relevant, even though he did not have the size that. But at the same time, too. We're talking about one of the first guys hitting moves like the superplex. Absolutely. And it is well known about uh, how stiff he was in the ring. And I'm not talking about like stiff performance wise, but when he was hitting a move, it looked like it hurt a little bit extra than anybody else hitting it. He just looked like when he'd punch you, he'd look so much harder with it. His clotheslines just looked so much more crisp Mm -hmm. and so much harder hitting. Let's get into it. Start of his career. Where exactly did Dynamite Kid start this stuff off, man? was born, Goldborn, England, and he started doing uh, construction with his father. His father was an ex-boxer. He, he mentions that his father uh, trained him in fisticuffs a bit when he was young. His dad went on to uh, do construction, and that's where he met a man by the name of Ted Bentley. Ted Bentley. Wasn't he involved with the uh, Snake Pit Gym in Wigham, UK? Ted Bentley, who I guess at one point had wrestled as a Dr. Death moniker, who took him to meet Billy Riley, where the the shoot fighters and the pro wrestling would meet you had guys that with that old school hooker mentality just vicious that's probably where dynamite first learned to be so so freaking mean and so uh effective in the ring so he eventually started training with a guy by the name of billy chambers and by the age of 16 he was ready to make his debut his first match against a guy by the name of bobby Hums. I just have one question there tim you said he was a hooker you said he was working the street corners out there buddy <laughs> You know, times were tough back then. You had to do what you had to do to make ends meet up. So a hooker, you hear that term applied to guys like Billy Robinson or Luthez. And the idea was that was the old school grapplers that were, if you were going to try to shoot or pull some. Now, this is the time where wrestling was moving from a lot of the more legit grappling aspects to more fictional for entertainment purposes. There would be a lot of people in different territories that would try to take something on you and try to try to gain a little bit something from your reputation by by hurting you in the ring. They were known for being vicious wrestlers. These were guys who knew that legitimate real MMA style as well as the the performance aspect. Right, right. So almost like a uh, I kind of want to compare that to almost like um, Ken Shamrock almost of today. Uh, just a way that you see him you is go, like. Yeah. In the ring, if you were to try to do, um, let's say you were to try to be too stiff with him, once he'd get you in like an ankle lock or something, he knew how to actually do it, so it would actually <laughs> hurt you, type of things. That yeah, that's uh, a that's an interesting way. You have people who were then trained in legitimate uh, bone breaking arts, you know, and that that's these guys could, you know, a Luthez could snap you if he really wanted to, and it wasn't just BS, you know. So the Dynamite Kid is learning this hardcore Smash Mouth style of. From his connections with Ted Bentley, who was training him, uh, Bentley gave him a chance by contacting uh, Max Crabtree. Crabtree. I'm not familiar with uh, him. Which uh, promotion was he a part of? Now, uh, let's put it this way. His brother was Shirley Crabtree, which is known as Big Daddy. Mm, So we're talking the 70s and catch wrestling style, uh, you know, England. 
Uh, from there, Dynamite got his first televised match against a guy, a fellow by the name of Pete Meredith. He worked with uh, Big Daddy a lot. From his own words, he was usually the underneath guy. He was the guy that, uh, you know, they would have a tag match and you'd have one tag partner. You see it all the time. He goes in there. He gets the crap kicked out of him and it builds up the big hot tag. So when he uh, brings his partner in. The guy can come in like a house of fire, get the big victory, send the crowd home happy. And uh, Dynamite's own complaints is that, well, he was young. He could bump, you know, and uh, Big Daddy would come in, look like the big hero. And uh, so he was there in the the European, you know, catch us, catch can wrestling, working with fellows like Haystacks Calhoun and Kendo Nagasaki and the uh, Mark uh, Rollerball Rocco. Rollerball Rocco. Why is that name – vaguely um, familiar i've heard this name before sir yeah 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 i know you're thinking of black tiger which is what he became later on another smash mouth style kind of wrestler and uh dynamite had a lot of good things to say about them that these are the guys he sort of cut his his teeth with and about at the age of 18 he got his first uh his first actual title so this is about we're talking 1976 oh wow so that's God, 77 that's so maybe far beyond me man <laughs> yeah yeah that's me too as a matter of fact but the dynamite kid is he's already showing people and it was ted bentley who came up with the name dynamite kid by the way according to what tom billington says bentley had asked a young man hey would you like this fellow's autograph he was sitting there with uh, tom billington and he's like hey would you like this guy's autograph he's a he's a great wrestler he's the dynamite kid and he looked at uh, billington he's like hey you know how to spell the word dynamite you know and kind of pats him on the back. So that was his first autograph. And it was Bentley who came up with the name. And he stuck with his entire career. So that's kind of interesting. And it was there in 1978 that Bruce Hart had witnessed him. And so that's, when you say Hart, are we talking like Hart Foundation style Hart? Or who are we talking absolute, about, man? That's absolutely. You're, you're dead on. We're talking about uh, Stu Hart's son. And we're talking about Stampede Wrestling in Calgary. And you have the, the, you know, the young hearts there. You got a bunch of... People like Junkyard Dog, and there are young Hercules, Hercules Hernandez, and this is a chance for uh, Dynamite Kid. He goes over there. He's working uh, young Jim Nightheart, Abdullah the Butcher, and it was from there uh, that he got his chance to go to uh, to uh, Germany with Bret Hart. So it was during these these eras that you know, he first meets uh, Satoru Sayamu wrestling as uh, Sam Ely and such. It's also during this time he meets JYD. Wrestling in uh, Stampede, who I believe was uh, uh, Big Daddy Ritter at the time. And he says this is when he first started uh, getting introduced. This is about 1979 to steroids. Incredible as a wrestler, Dynamite was already going out there impressing people with his hard work. Unfortunately, uh, he he was dabbling a little bit, which becomes um, much of an issue later on, as we're going to get to. Right, right. I mean – from what I've seen and heard, a big part of his career and his life later on is heavily affected by the drug use and whatnot, and it really does screw up a lot of parts of his life. I've heard a lot of stories about apparently JYD just used to be like, I don't know, distributor, just the gateway for almost everybody, it seems like, to like start getting into these drugs and everything. But regardless of that, where does it go from here, man? Uh, he met a fellow by the name of uh, Hidachi who uh, got him a chance to wrestle in International Wrestling Enterprise. And this is the first time he worked in Japan. And uh, he apparently did well enough that he got a chance to, uh, from other promoters, to come and wrestle Tatsumi Fujinami, and at, who was at this time the WWF Junior Light Heavyweight uh, Champion. Right, right. And whenever you say uh, like any kind of Junior Heavyweight title, it kind of brings me to thinking about uh, IWGP's Junior Heavyweight title and just how it is considered one of the uh, – higher ones to be held in Japan and how so many have held it that are considered the rising stars. You know, Liger has held it multiple times. I believe Nakamura held it at a very young age as well. And it's one of those things that I believe is just known as a badge of honor over in the Japanese side of wrestling. Absolutely. He goes and he gets a chance to work Fujinami. He also gets a chance to work guys like Anoki and Choshu and tag bouts and such. And he's still working Stampede at this time. This is, uh, we're talking, we're getting about 1980. And his manager at the time is a guy called John Foley. Foley's sort of interesting. There are some dark rumors surrounding him, which we will get to. All right. So um, around this time, would you say this is, uh, wasn't it 82 where he eventually has his uh, matches with uh, Tiger Mask? And these are considered some of the best matches that like even McFoley talks about uh, as a young man. He kept rewinding and just watching these matches in like slow motion to the point where he's like breaking tapes of it. 
not necessarily how well the moves were always executed, but the speed and the precision and just everything about the match itself was just so well done that so many people are really captivated by it, especially at the time. And it really does come in later on with, uh, from what I've heard, that was one of his greatest works was, uh, I believe it was 1982 at the time. There's an excellent match with Tiger Mask versus the Dynamite Kid for the WWF Light Heavyweight Championship in Madison Square Garden, and it's great. You can hear Vince McMahon on commentary. You can hear Gorilla Monsoon. And during this, Gorilla Monsoon refers to them as the future of wrestling. And he was right. Tiger Mask is doing things like whipping his opponent into the corner. He runs and he climbs up them and does a backflip off it. He's doing things like the moonsault. He's doing dives to the outside. From his matches with Tiger Mask in 82 to 83, he's really set the standard that people would try to emulate later. You're, You're seeing some incredible stuff. Right. And honestly, the way that I could compare seeing some of the stuff that was done in those matches, the way that I can kind of describe it today is almost like watching a match of Will Ospreay or maybe Ricochet in a way. The way that they work with outside dives, the moonsaults, everything that they do, this was kind of brand new back in the 80s because it was more, how do I describe it? A different kind of show. I, I'm going to tell you. You didn't see high flying then. You'd you'd see a, a match, you know, a wrestler would come out, and some leagues more so than others. WBF, uh, and that's what it was at the time, is the World Wrestling Federation didn't have high flyers, so to speak. They, you you'd refer to a guy as being agile, and you know, you had Jimmy Snook and such. But really, towards the end of the match, he would do a big flying splash. Most of the time, these guys would hit a lot of drop kicks and a cross body block. And that's what really, that's the type of move set you'd expect. You didn't see people doing dives to the outside. It did not come around often at all. Let me tell you, I, 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 the first time I saw it, it was people like, of course, dynamite and, uh, Ricky, the dragon steamboat who were, you know, another legendary performer who pushed work right as it was. But I guess the difference between, say, them and so, someone like a, a, a Ricochet or Will Ospreay, and there's nothing – I'm not trying to take anything away from those guys. Uh, you know, Ricochet and you know, Ospreay are fantastic workers, is that it looked so legit with Tiger Mask and Dynamite. They would just – they still worked hard as hell. They were slugging each other with these, these shots that had old-school Smash Mouth-style pro wrestling with every shot, and it didn't look like an aerial exhibition. It didn't look like uh, some sort of – festival for spots it looked like they were trying to hurt each other and i think that's why a lot of people still cherish a lot of these matches today because they walk that that sort of edge you know on the you know between being fantastic entertainment and still being brutality that makes you believe it's kind of a fight right right and that's something that the way that i kind of see wrestling today is there's two sides to the spectrum for those diehard fans really you've got the people that are more on the side of jim cornette where it's like hey i want this to look at least somewhat realistic so i don't have to suspend belief i want it to look like yeah this is something that could happen in a fight whereas understandable whereas then there's people like Meltzer who are like you know what i just want to be entertained so what if they're you know all doing a flip uh, off the top rope and almost like everybody doing it in sequence or something like that. If it's entertaining, let it go type of thing, which I get it. I can understand both sides, but realistically it feels like that was just the best of both worlds and seeing clips of it and everything. It's like, these guys really did it and really tried their best to do both at the same time. And they perfected it somehow just right. Oh, it was, yeah, there was, it, there's something there that's just, you know, different. Yeah. You're, you're not seeing something that just looks uh practice, I guess is what I'm saying. It doesn't look like they're cooperating. And interesting enough, you mentioned Meltzer. He actually, the second match, the second five-star match he ever gave out in his ratings, according to him, was Tiger Mask and Dynamite Kid, which is interesting. Right. He's very well known for uh, giving out ratings to certain matches. I know that uh, a few years ago he had gave, who was it, Kenny Omega and Kazushita Okada, I believe, the first ever six-star And ever since then, it's kind of gone off the rails with the rating system. But, you know, that's I guess that's kind of how it goes when something just blows your mind to the point where you're like, I didn't think it could be this good. Tiger Mask eventually leaves New Japan. And those matches they had at that time were absolutely those two together. They were timeless. But Dynamite continues, you know, with his career. And he's now working in places like Portland. 
where he is in a group called the Klan with uh, men like Rip Oliver and the Cuban Assassin. And this is it's here that he starts meeting uh, Billy Jack Haynes and Kurt Hennig, who have you know Mr. Perfect, an incredible wrestler. Hennig, of course, isn't quite the size and such that he was in later years, but right off the bat, if you see these early matches in '83, you can tell that you know Hennig is going to be something special. And uh, right, because uh, Henning, he became Mr. Perfect, right? I mean, that's yeah, Kurt absolutely Hennig. Well, right, and that was after he. Uh, not not only you know he went to the AWA became a champion there and such. It's I, I I'm I'm kind of a mark for Mr. Perfect, so I really think he could have been a world you know contender. But I I don't think I guess maybe at the time in the WWF that wouldn't have worked as well. You you always had a face led uh, champion, you know a, a, a face champion, a baby face, and you know maybe he didn't work that, that as well that way, but. Um, Going on, though, right off the bat, he's working these great guys. He's, in his own words, though, he's starting to hit the steroids pretty hard. And the Dynamite Kid is now up to 225, especially because, you know, he's describing Hennig as small. And Hennig's, uh, you know, a bit taller than him and such. He starts to get Davy Boy Smith, uh, who's his uh, brother-in-law, I believe. Uh, I believe that was his uh, cousin of some sort from what I had uh heard and seen i heard that they were cousins his brother-in-law actually ended up being a uh, bret hart believe it or not yeah i think you're correct I, my apologies uh <clears throat> so he gets davy boy and, and they start wrestling in new japan as a team and he's also working singles matches with a guy known as the cobra which is george takano he's who he's worked in the past but this was sort of they did the best they could. Tiger Mask is gone now, and they start bringing in a Black Tiger, which, of course, was the before-mentioned Mark Rollerball Rocco. That's about at the time of 84 or so. Sayama contacts Dynamite, tries to get him to work with for UWF. And if you've heard of the UWF, it was sort of a promotion that was supposed to be a combination of the entertainment with uh, a very heavy aspect uh, going towards – uh, realism and mixed martial arts style fighting. They didn't want to do a bunch of backdrops and, you know, they didn't want people flying off the top rope. And so you have people like Sayama and Akira Mieda there. Billington declines the offer and uh, UWA did have some success later, but then after that, they kind of, you know, kind, kind of fizzled out. And uh, during this time, he's still working with, uh, of course, Calgary wrestling and such. He's, he's going all over the place after uh, Tiger Mask and the, after Tiger Mask had left, he starts to work with Giant Baba in all Japan. There was a, kind of a uh, a shift there, and in Japan, all Japan was starting to gain quite a bit of uh, credibility and traction with better wrestlers and such. And that's where they're attracting people like the Funk Brothers, uh, you know, Terry and his brother Dory, where uh, that's you know the, the the British Bulldogs, as they would eventually become, are now working. They're not the Bulldogs yet. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You were going to say something. Oh, no, I was just going to ask about, so Terry and Dory Funk, weren't they uh, from Texas or something like that? Oh, absolutely. Amarillo, Texas. These are the guys who uh, uh, they have, they eventually Terry Funk started the Funk U University and the absolutely yeah An Amarillo, Texas. And so these are old school, you know, mid-south kind of kind of brawlers. And they had some fantastic matches. These guys would just beat the hell out of each other. There's some great ones with the Funk brothers take also taking on uh, – uh, Bruiser Brody and Jimmy Snuka during this kind of era in all Japan. I highly recommend it, but not going to be for the faint of heart. There's a lo lot of blood, and these are very stiff shots. Yeah, Dynamite right up his alley, and he liked Terry Funk right off the bat, who was kind of a prankster and a, a goofball just like he was. Um, right. I mean, I've heard uh, a lot about uh, – uh, there's a lot of ribbing back in the day from what I've heard, and ribbing for you guys who don't know, meaning that there was a lot of pranks that went on, but there was some people who really were against it because, you know, ribbing on somebody, it could be anything from, you know, taking a dump inside their gym bag or whatever to shaving their head while they're asleep, stuff like that. But some wrestlers who were like out on the road for a long time, they just didn't find it funny after it's like, hey, I've been, you know, away from home for, you know, two months now. This is all I've got, and you're really gonna, you know, defecate on everything I have, type of thing. But, you know, that sort of stuff going on. And um, but yeah, please continue, Tim. This is amazing <laughs> stuff. 
Well, it's 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 interesting that you go that way, you know, that route because yeah, he and uh, he and uh, Davy Boy Smith are eventually known for doing some pretty ridiculous and some pretty hard the type of ribs that you you start to think to yourself is that really a joke? Um, and w- one of their favorites actually is cutting up other wrestlers' clothes with scissors while the guy's out wrestling, going into the guy's bag. But anyhow, after his time there, this is uh. Back in Calgary, he's he's also wrestling in, in Calgary and all Japan at the time, and that's where he uh, and Bret Hart, when they're wrestling each other, end up getting the attention of a man named George Scott, who works with Vince McMahon, mm. and this is where they get their first invitations to go down and do some matches for some television tapings. He and Bret Hart, they travel down there and they wrestle, and he says they they do a couple matches. They do they do some tag team matches as well and such. This is without Davy Boy. He complained about what they were paid, actually. He says it was something like the equivalent of $25 each. That's not, you know, not very good. But then they were promised, hey, you come back, we're doing a loop, and we're going to be doing a bunch of house shows in New York. It's going to be good money. And when he returns, and at this time, uh, Vince McMahon is also working with Stampede a little bit. He meets Vince McMahon. Vince takes a look at him and Davy Boy, who Dynamite has told him about. He says, I got this, uh, I got this cousin. Excuse me, you know, cousin. Vince looks at them and he is like, you know what? You guys look like a couple of bulldogs. You know, they're wide, they're angry looking. That it was Vince who came up with the idea of the British bulldogs. Interesting. Always leave it up to Vince for some good character ideas, but then again, you know, one of his ideas for uh, Stone Cold's character was supposed to be uh, Baron von Frost and stuff like that. So <laughs> not always, but I think he hit the nail on the head with this one. Hey, you know, and that's that's Vince for you. He. He's the guy who changed the business, and he also, you know, he, he's come up with the Undertaker. He also came up with Bastion Booger. So let's put that in, you know, perspective there. So they, uh, he was the one who came up with them wearing the Union Jack, you know, a uh, uh, British design, and he was also the one that decided that they would come out with Bulldogs. And Vince has come up with some pretty hokey things, you know. He, he's we could have been worse. We could have been the Red Rooster, you know. So. All we had to do was walk a couple bulldogs to the ring. It wasn't so bad, and it did go over well with the crowds. They, you know, they start to take off. Vince is building towards WrestleMania too, and during this time, the Hart Foundation has started off in the WWF. The you know, Brett is there as well. You know, things are you know really growing. Dynamite Kid and Davy Boy are still working some matches in All Japan, where he meets Mitsuharu Misawa, another fantastic wrestler, another. Dave Meltzer favorite, uh, another five-star kind of wrestler. At this time, Misawa is wrestling as Tiger Mask number two. They're having pretty good matches and such, though Misawa was a different kind of Tiger Mask than Sayama was. He was less agile, less acrobatic, more of a more of a heavyweight, but still a very good wrestler, a little, little less theatrical in general. That's Misawa. Any match you watch with him, he doesn't give a whole lot of emotion to the crowd. But between working All Japan and working the WWF, he's doing quite well. And in WrestleMania 2, they've decided that the British Bulldogs should get the tag team titles in Chicago. Now, in, in WrestleMania 2, that's the one where Vince decided with closed circuit television and such, he was going to book out three arenas, make the most money he could. You have to understand, folks, this is before standard pay-per-view as we know it. And so he has Hogan wrestling King Kong Bundy in a steel cage. In Los Angeles, Randy Savage and George the Animal Steel for the Intercontinental title in New York. You also have the Dream Team, Brutus Beefcake, Greg the Hammer Valentine taking on the Bulldogs, and that's in Chicago. And this is 1986, WrestleMania 2. A smashing success. An odd finish to the match, though, I have to say. Did you ever watch that match? Uh, so I've seen some clips of it, but I have not seen the finish of it. So please elaborate. It's it's an odd finish. Uh, the idea is, I guess the maneuver they use is referred to as a, a sort of sacrifice maneuver that Ole and Gene Anderson would use, where one tag team partner would slam the head of an opponent into his, his own partner. So it's like a forced headbutt where you grab your enemy and you slam him into your buddy's face. And that's what the, the British Bulldogs did. They, they wrestle a pretty good match with Beefcake and Valentine. And right. at one point, you can see Dynamite on the second row. He starts patting his head to get Davy Boy's attention. Davy Boy smacks Greg the Hammer's head into his. Greg the Hammer goes down like he's completely out. Davy Boy Smith gets the pinfall for the three before Brutus Beefcake can interrupt. But what you 
don't see real well in the footage. And I highly if, – if you watch this match, I highly recommend you check it out slow motion if you have to. The fall Dynamite Kid takes is ridiculous. You know, it's a headbutt to headbutt. He is standing on the second row, and he falls from there. Got to be a good nine feet onto concrete. And the camera doesn't even capture that it that well. The, the, the crowd saw it, and it was pretty intense. And I'm sure that's what he was trying to do is show you a big, you know, incredible moment. But it was a little disappointing when you watched it on, you know, uh, on footage. People miss it a lot. We all know about the infamous Mick Foley falling off of the Hell in a Cell after being pushed off by Undertaker and falling through the announcer table. Could you imagine if the camera just didn't catch that? Now we have the British Bulldogs as the World Tag Team Champions. And this is about the time they have Matilda as their manager or their mascot, I guess. But right. Uh, who exactly was Matilda again? Just remind me, please. I'm a little lost uh, on that. Matilda was just a bulldog. She was a, a sweet little dog that Vince gave them. Dynamite talks about this in his book, and he says that what they would do to try to get Matilda to chase some of the, the villains' managers and such, whether it's Bobby Heenan or Slick or whatever, is that he would have – ask one of them to go up and keep taking her toys. Or he said they would ask Slick to kind of kind of prod her a little bit with his cane to kind of piss her off all the time so that Matilda actually hated these guys and didn't know much better. Sometimes it worked. If you watch some of these old matches, you can see they get in the ring with Matilda and she'll go right after Jimmy Hart's megaphone or whatever. And that's, you know, it looks great for television. That is interesting to hear about how they potentially did a little bit of animal training to get a little bit of a reaction and a little something just, you know, having, um, oh, even the animal doesn't like him sort of thing. And just she's that well in sync with uh, the team that she was the mascot for. That's interesting. And I like that. So they're tag team champions at this point. They're kind of just going up and up in popularity. Uh, yeah. What goes on uh, next with them, man? Around this time in 86, he has a match with, he's tagging with Davy Boy Smith, and they're taking on Orton. This is uh, Randy Orton's father, Bob oh, Orton. Bob Cowboy Orton. And his tag team partner, that magnificent Morocco, Don Morocco. During this bout, he's working against Morocco, and he gets whipped into the ropes. Dynamite is supposed to jump over him and hit the opposite ropes. And he said there was something about the leap that he pulled his back right there in the middle of it. So he hits the other side, jumping over his opponent, and then from there he kind of collapses. And in right. his own, I uh, I believe that after that he uh, had to have surgery on his back, and I believe it was something along the lines of having two discs pulled out of his back afterwards, just being removed completely. This is where he started to experience some some big problems. First of all, he couldn't finish the match very well. He ended up just laying there. He kind of drags himself over. He tags Davy Boy, who ends up finishing the match. And from there, he's he's now injured. Transport him back home to uh, Calgary, actually. He's in the hospital. In his own words, Davy Boy only came to visit him when he came with – he arrived with his wife. They showed up. They got a photo for the local newspaper in Calgary, and then they left. And as far as Tom Billington says, he claims that that was, that was probably it, you know, that, that Davy Boy – Apparently didn't give a damn, and they they you know, they were just doing it for you know exposure, you know for for you know for press and such. So it's it's hard to say whether Davy Boy really didn't care about him or or what, but that's kind of how he paints the picture. After this, that's when Dynamite started to go a little downhill. Right. I mean, he had the injury and everything. At that point, I don't want to say you're becoming useless, but you're going to have a little bit less of everything at that point, at least. During the healing process, and according to, uh, I had watched the uh, Dark Side of the Ring episode about Dynamite Kid, and uh, people claimed, yeah, he wasn't out for very long. He was out for maybe two weeks and tried to get back in the ring already after that, even though he was told he shouldn't be working anymore. And uh, it was claimed that at that point, that is when they were told that they had to drop the titles because, well, you know, you're hurt at that point. They don't want to absolutely just destroy this man's body completely. He actually, from, from what he describes, he's 28 at this time, and he's finally told by a, a doctor where he hears the words where they're like, maybe you should find another career. You know, so you're 28 and you're already being told, hey, this is enough for you. He's refusing that, and he's talking about, yeah, not only is he having the problems with his back, he had issues with his leg. His left leg was apparently not responding correctly, and there were some signs of paralysis, though it did come back to him. And Bret Hart did come to visit him. 
And while there, Brett and he, he are talking. Brett says, Vince would like it if I can uh, maybe take the title back with me. We have to continue. We have stuff we got to do. You know, things have to go on. You know, Dynamite refuses to give him the title. Brad Hart returns back to, you know, the, the Federation and apparently tells Vince this, who then calls Tom Billington later. Can't, you know, have, you know, a, a belt that's not being defended. You know, let, let's, you know, let's figure this out. And uh, the solution they came up with is they have the Dynamite Kid, who's now been training for a little bit, return with Davy Boy. And he, they walk to the ring. I remember watching this as a kid. They're walking to the ring arm in arm, which is such a strange and by that, I don't mean they're working with their arm around each other like, hey, buddy, how you doing? Like if you'd put your hands on your hips and there's someone else doing the same thing and you you sort of link at elbows. He, he walks down the ringside with him like that because apparently the dynamite kid just could not walk correctly. And this is what they had to do. So they, they get there. Jimmy Hart's megaphone is used against him so he can be knocked out at ringside. The Hart Foundation, Jim Neidhart and Bret Hart, end up wrestling Davy Boy in what's almost a handicap match. They have dangerous Danny Davis, not quite yet, but the, the referee Danny Davis, who they are starting to show as a heel referee, uh, going against the, 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 the faces and the good guys of the WWF. He keeps checking on Dynamite on the outside in a way that it keeps allowing the Hart Foundation to just keep working almost like a, a handicap match against Davy Boy. Of course, this leads to them getting the titles after several double team maneuvers, and that's that. Danny Davis ends up working with the Hart Foundation in a WrestleMania appearance against the Bulldogs. During this time, it's just interesting seeing how his performance really just kind of flattens out for a little bit, and you can tell it's just different from how he was. It's a little bit disappointing and a little bit heartbreaking knowing that guy was 28. I'm 25 right now, and that feels like, man, that's only three years away from me. I didn't really realize that. I do understand business is business. Maybe they should have just vacated the titles and said, well, look, go a little bit reality with it and just say, hey, you know, the champion was injured, but he wants to fight back for the title. So we're going to hold a, you know, tag team tournament or whatever for whoever's going to win the belts. And then, you know, they'll be able to try to win them back or whatever while he recovers and then is able to come back for it. You know, maybe they should have thought about some around those lines to get him at least interested and not too upset about the whole situation, I guess, maybe not have his pride in the way of things. Yeah. Well, what what are you going to do there? You have a situation, you, you the show must go on mm -hmm. and the WWF is getting so much momentum. And at this point you got to realize too, the Bulldogs are, they're in a great position, but you know, you have this league that's exploding at the time and you got to do what you got to do. Business is business. Anyways, they use this to to build towards the, the big match at WrestleMania three. And, you know, Billington has been training and working out again. And the thing is, he's at that age, he's doing so many steroids. He's he describes himself at one point that he's doing steroids. He's doing cortisone shots. You're not you're not supposed to take cortisone all the time. It's not supposed to be something that you just do once a week. And that's how he's describing it. And it's supposed to be something you'd take maybe twice a year. Or else it can damage the joints and the muscles in your body, which comes back to him later. But Dynamite Kid, Tom Bellington, he sort of lived for the moment. He just kept kept rocking on, kept going. Right, right. And um, something that uh, was mentioned by uh, Jacques Rougeau, uh, he had said that he remembered at one point seeing uh, Billington walking around in the uh, locker room. He had a needle sticking out of his butt and it's just kind of like <laughs> moving and just dangling there. And he's like yelling, I'm going to have a great match tonight. And then he just sees him walk out and he's just kind of like scarred for life watching as this dude's just walking around with his needle just flailing out of his butt like that. <laughs> oh, hey, that's that's. There's so many stories about the guy. I believe it's uh, the Honky Tonk Man mentions Dynamite Kid gives himself a shot with uh, with a steroid at one point, you know, right in the arse cheek. He would just throw the needle, you know, like on the ground or whatever, you know, didn't even bother with the trash. At the time, it wasn't even like he was trying to hide the steroid usage, but a lot everyone was doing it, I guess, at the time. There was something that I had seen as well about uh, Spivey had talked about. Uh, yeah, a lot of guys, they would just shoot up, then they would throw it into a wall like it was a dart. And he called <laughs> everybody that was in the locker room just idiot wrestlers, but that was just how it was back then. It's who they were, you know? It's easy for us to laugh, but I guess they were 
They were living like rock stars. They had that mentality that, you know, you have that much testosterone, that, that much ego in the room, and people are going to act like tough guys. They're, they're destroying their bodies, but they, at the time, they were, it was what they need. It was what they needed that boost. I might not agree with it, but that's what they did, unfortunately. Dynamite Kid was doing it like crazy, and he's having all sorts of problems. So he and the Davy Boy Smith are starting to have some issues. And it's about this time when they had a day off, I guess, they decide to fill in a match for in Stampede Wrestling. You have to understand the Bulldogs did not sign to a major contract like a lot of other wrestlers did. They wanted to still be free to go wrestle in All Japan Pro Wrestling or Stampede or wherever they liked to make as much money as they could. Dynamite was always booking based on how he could you know, build his bank account, which is smart. You, you, it's business. you got to make the money where you can. But a lot of wrestlers, you, you work for the WWF, focus on that. It's the, you know, the big coming league, and that's what Vince wanted. Obviously, that was the way of the future is that people would work just one specific league and one you know, travel with just that. And he did get in trouble for filling in, doing a match in Stampede. And that's what Vince had told like, hey, even if you're not signed to a contract, you're, you're not going to go work, you know, some indie and, you know, the, the North American leagues and such. And that's not the way it works, you know. So. Jeez, a little controlling, but I get it. You want your league to be almost exclusively just who you have on your roster to an extent. I understand Vince's point of view on that. That if you're working other places, it it diminishes the, you know, the, the World Wrestling Federation. And as a wrestling fan, maybe I didn't like it at the time, but I I, I guess I understand Vince's motivations. It it helped him to become the promoter that he did. You know, concepts like that. Right, right. So yeah, moving on from there, him coming back from Stampede. So I think we know what people kind of want to hear about. Let's start to move into the uh, Rougeau incident and some of the things that happened in the locker room, man. In 1987, he first worked with them in the Survivor Series. He tagged up with the Killer Bees, the Strike Force, the Rougeaus, of course, and the Young Stallions when they took on Demolition, the Islanders, the Hart Foundation, and the tag team of Dino Bravo and Greg Valentine. The Bulldogs were living in eliminated by the Islanders, the Young Stallions, and the Killer Bees end up going on to win the bout. He right. describes not liking the Rougeaus. He says that when you were around the Rougeaus, uh, Jacques and Raymond Rougeau, who are French Canadians, and he, he claims that they would uh, talk to each other in their own language, and it, it made you feel like you were outside of the, the inside joke. He describes them not being very popular with the rest of the roster anyway. The whole incident seemed to come about when Kurt Hennig, Mr. Perfect, who was quite the ribber himself, decided to uh, snip up some of the clothes of the Rougeaus and apparently made it look that the British Bulldogs were behind it, which was not a surprise because they had done this to several other people. Interesting. Some of the ribbing coming back again to haunt them in a way, but, you know, it's just how the business was at the time. Uh, Dynamite claims that, well, this is one of the times we did not do it, and Jacques Rougeau, uh, according to uh, Kurt Hennig, had you know, stooged them out to Vince McMahon or someone, he said, or was trying to. So he walks in during a card game that Kurt Hennig is having with uh, Jacques Rougeau and uh, Raymond, who is also there. Dynamite walks in with sort of an entourage. He has uh, Bad News Brown with him and Don Morocco and a couple of the guys he's friendly with. And uh, he walks up and just blasts. Uh, Jacques Rougeau in the side of the, the head, kind of palm strikes from behind and knocks, right. knocks Jacques right out of his chair. And Jacques is trying to be reasonable with him. Hey, what's going on? Why, you know, why, are, you, why are you angry at me? What's going on? And his brother Raymond has to step in. And it's interesting because there's a couple different arguments on this. One is that uh, Dynamite claims he knocked out both of them, in his own words, and in – Raymond Rougeau's is that he, you know, he soccer punched uh, his brother, Jacques Rougeau, and then that was basically it. Then he had left. And Raymond Rougeau was known for being kind of tough himself. He was a Golden Gloves boxer, and a lot of wrestlers knew this about him. But he had injured himself previously uh, before this and was on crutches himself. So he wasn't really, you know, a tough guy. Otherwise, he, he claimed he would have tried to step in and actually fight because – 
Jacques Rougeau was not supposed to be a, a tough fella at all. I'm not saying he wasn't tough as a pro wrestler, but he wasn't he didn't have the reputation that someone like, say, Dynamite Kid does. Right, right. And uh, seeing the way that he even talked about himself, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy to carry himself to be like not really looking for fights or anything. But from Rougeau's own words in Dark Side of the Rings special about the Dynamite Kid was he had talked to his father about like what to do because he was kind of plotting revenge at that point. Taking his father's advice, which was go to the bank, get yourself a roll of quarters and then go ahead, get him back, sucker punch him the way that he <laughs> did to you. And according to him, he waited and was just waiting for a dynamite after a match. And he said for a week he hadn't looked dynamite kid in the eyes. But then that day he was waiting for him. And uh, as he saw him walking over towards him, he said, hey, how's it going? He said dynamite kid lifted his head up, with, had a coffee in his hand. And then as soon as he lifted his head up, immediately just punched him straight under the chin. And he said, you know, those monster movies that you see as a kid and how there's blood spewing everywhere. Well, it's true. I knocked out four teeth and that's the way that it kind of looked at that point. And then I yelled at him next time I'll put you in a wheelchair. Censoring, of course. Vince McMahon had apparently spoken to them and said, hey, I'm going to talk to you guys soon because he knew something was brewing. He knew there was problems, you know, going on in this locker room. And the Rougeaus knew that if they didn't do something soon, you know, if they, they reacted after Vince spoke to them and told them, hey, you know, I don't want any more violence, then that was their jobs. And he went down to one knee and Raymond Rougeau is cheering his brother on. Come on, come on. Try to jab, 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 you know, to try to take him out. Raymond can't get involved. He's on crutches. Dynamite is not going down, but he's trying to hold on to Raymond and eventually or Jacques Rougeau. And eventually he does when Jacques. He jabs him enough that he goes down. Bad News Brown gets in, separates everyone. And after that, the Rougeau brothers go and they immediately go speak to Vince McMahon, who was in the middle of speaking to Hogan at the time. And the Dynamite Kid is taken off to go get uh, his teeth fixed. It was a couple weeks later. Vince brings them all together and he has the Rougeau brothers agree to pay for Dynamite's teeth. And drops it at that. Though the Rougeaus deny that they ever actually paid to it. They just said it, and then apparently Vince paid for it. And Dynamite, also in his book, Pure Dynamite, claims that he got his teeth fixed for free, so he pulled one on them anyway. And several wrestlers have stated that that's the point where Dynamite wasn't quite the same guy after that. Because his sort of tough guy status and the way he sort of swaggered uh, was, was changed. You know, People had seen him fall, and he was never quite the same. Right. At that point, it had seemed like his ego had started to fall off. Now, uh, one other thing that had happened uh, after the incident and a little bit of the falling action from all of that was uh, it gave Dynamite Issue some issues with his confidence and everything. And eventually it led to him buying a gun to give to his wife, because according to him, apparently Dino Bravo, who, you know, he had his mafia ties and everything and all that stuff that had went on. Uh, with his career, well, apparently he had seen a envelope with, uh, you know, Thomas Billington's family, home, uh, address, names, everything in it. And he was telling them, like, hey, you might want to be careful. I think Jacques may have done something to, like, prevent any kind of retaliation. And according to Jacques Rougeau, he set that up, that it wasn't actually real, but he made something up that Dino Bravo would believe enough that he would go back to the dynamite kid and tell him, yeah, you guys better be careful sort of thing. Whereas Jacques Rougeau claims, well, I guess it worked. He wasn't going to bother me again, sort of thing. I guess really trying to get rid of the bully a hard way. And no, I guess it worked because you never really hear about any kind of issue after that. If they were working dynamite a little bit, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Can you really blame them? You know, I, I, considering all the pranks and stuff he pulled on everyone else, they probably just wanted it to be done. And, he also had mentioned that during this time that uh, Chief J. Strongbow had uh, or tried to buy some steroids off of uh, Tom Billington. And Billington said, well, I just gave him 10 bottles or so. And he ended up, you know, also getting fined. You know, who knows if the, the steroids were something to, you know, tell back to McMahon or, you know, whatever. Probably not because Mintz was probably doing them too. And the Bulldogs were starting to uh, – maybe lose a little bit of favor. You know, there was a lot of bad, bad talk going on about them in you know, the locker rooms and such. And it was a little surprising later on when they were supposed to fly elsewhere 
and there's only so many flight coupons that were passed out to the wrestlers. Billington claims that Strongbow, as Vince's agent, uh, seemed to mysteriously not have flight coupons for both he and Davy Boy. He believed at this point that things were starting, you know, that this was a punishment and things were starting to catch up. So he went and he called Giant Baba. Right. Um, what year would you say this was at this time point? This would have to be around 1988. Okay, that makes sense. They finished up their time there doing the uh, Survivor Series match. They were supposed to do bouts with the Brain Busters as well. And apparently Tom Billington did not like, he said Arn Anderson was all right, but he, did, he didn't think much of uh, Tully Blanchard. So he, he instead asked, no, nah, let, let's just do, I don't want to lose to those guys. And so he ends up going to All Japan. And doing some uh, some work there. This is around uh, 89. He ends up starting to work Danny Spivey uh, with Stan Hansen, Toshiaki Kawada, and uh, the Malankos, uh, Joe and Dean. He had very good things to say about the Malankos, which isn't a surprise. They're fantastic wrestlers, and they're not that different from his style. But this is where things started to go you know, a little off the rails. And it's uh, in Japan, I think he mentions they, they go a little harsh on a man by the name of mitch snow mm, right yeah you and i talked about mitch snow a little he dynamite kid was not a fan of mitch snow he he describes mitch as being a bit of a loud mouth he said that mitch snow had made the claim that eh, the, the bulldogs are never going to get one over on me you know meaning they're never going to pull a a big prank on me you never say oh yeah they'll never get me because then they'll find a way to get you it doesn't matter who it is whether it's the bulldogs or whoever but if i remember this correctly so Mitch Snow, according to a few different wrestlers, including Spivey, said, yeah, he was a real uh, trash talker all the time, no matter what was going on. Any little situation that he could put his nose into be like, oh, yeah, you really screwed the pooch here for whatever reason. Now, eventually they had. I'm just going to preface this right now for anybody that's listening that has a uh, sensitivity to um, how do I put this things about like assault date rape, any of that kind of stuff, you should probably stop listening here because there's going to be mentions of roofies and the story only gets darker from here, honestly. So if you can't stomach some uh, darker things that happened in this man's life, you should probably stop here, honestly, and live your life Trigger thinking warning. that he was a great guy. Trigger warning, yeah. <laughs> so he essentially roofied uh, Mitch Snow. And from there, he basically collapsed in his uh, hotel room onto the bed and then Davy Boy Smith and Dynamite Kid, they went out the balcony, so they broke into his room. Apparently, they shaved off his eyebrows, shaved his head, took a dump in his gym bag, which I know I mentioned earlier, a little bit of foreshadowing. But yeah, they really just kind of screwed this guy up just to show like, oh, you thought that we couldn't get you? Here you go. And uh, Tim, when we were talking off camera, did you say that uh, something had happened with him having to uh, leave Japan early because of that? From what I understand, when Don Morocco uh, picks him up for a, a spike pile driver maneuver, both the Bulldogs jumped off turnbuckles and spiked him very hard. And after Mitch Snow is recovering from his problems, Davey Boy did go and damage his stuff. You know, oh, we got him in a prank. But it's, you know, he makes it sound so much more innocent <laughs> than what you describe. Right, right. Of course, he's going to have his rose colored glasses on and just say, oh, you know, we, um, yeah, we uh, just pulled a prank on him. No, that's not what that was. And in the words of Jacques Rougeau, once again, I keep kind of referring back to him because everything that he had said in the special about him, well, they like to rib on people. And, you know, it's funny when it's something small time, but man, when you're, you know, two months out on the road, it's not funny anymore when you haven't been home that long and this is all your stuff. This is all you have. It's not funny anymore when, you know, you haven't seen your family in this long and you're like, man, I've been gone this whole time. This is everything I have. And you guys just mutilated my face and my head doing this stuff and you're calling it a prank. Ha ha. But you're really just screwing me over long term. So that's kind of how he had seen it. And it was a pretty good way to describe it, I think, because it might be funny in a way, but realistically, it's kind of messed up when you're in the middle of a situation like that. Not to mention spiking someone on a pile driver. You know, three person assisted pile driver like that. Yeah. Right. Uh, there's that. And then there's also the spiking of the drinks and everything else. And it's like, man, come on, because that's what they had said in the Dark Side of the Ring episode was that they legitimately drugged him. But yeah, that kind of thing. 
So, yeah, he actually does mention later on, too, Mitch Snow, when he was going to wrestle in another league, one of the promoters contacts him and says, we, we got a guy here named Mitch Snow, and they, they would like to make sure that, that you're not going to try anything on them. And Dynamite, Tom Billington apparently couldn't turn down that temptation, you know, refused to not <laughs> further harass the man. So, so anyways, that's uh, pre- basically how we're ending out 1989. And uh, sort of in the 90s, he, do- he does mention he gets to wrestle – Cactus Jack, which is interesting because those of you who know uh, Mick Foley's book and you know what uh, Mick Foley talked about a situation with him and Dynamite Kid. Are you familiar with this, Maverick? Mick Foley had claimed that it was that he was still going by just Jack Foley at the time. He had claimed that during the match that, oh man, he said that Dynamite Kid went for a clothesline and he said it felt a lot less like a clothesline and more like he just clubbed me with his bicep and because of that it dislocated my jaw and for about three weeks i wasn't eating any solid food Good. said there was no ill will about the whole situation that it wasn't a huge uh uproar about it nobody was upset with each other he said that he shook their hands in the locker room afterwards and thanked them for the match and then he went um, back to his hotel room and threw up in the toilet yeah well mick's a pretty cool guy about getting the hell beat out of him yeah, that's that's what I I heard as well is that Dynamite Kid. I mean, he was known for that for doing that that clothesline, that hooking one. In his own words, he describes his version compared to how uh, Davy Boy would throw a clothesline. And he says, "Hey, if I'm throwing a clothesline at you, I'm running at you. I'm going to hook you. You better go down because if not, it's it's going to blast you." And you can see on those shots, it looks like it, for for those of you who have not watched a lot of him, look at uh, Chris Benoit throwing certain clotheslines it looks like you know killing the other guy with them uh <laughs> that was like one of his protégés wasn't it absolutely oh absolutely uh chris benoit looks like a carbon copy of him at times but that clothesline is so so vicious dynamite it looks like he's catching him with between the bicep and the forearm right under the neck half the time you know and when davy boy would do it he would he'd blast him with a clothesline and then he would lift off a little bit you know he'd hit him with the the bicep, you know, and try to connect with the other guy's pectoral. Well, that's what you're supposed to do with a clothesline. It's supposed to be that contact. And he says that, you know, Davy Boy would he'd hit and he would lift off. He felt that Davy Boy was being too gentle. And Davy's, you know, comment was like, hey, I, I don't want to rip a pectoral muscle on, you know, somebody else. And Dynamite, you know, he, he would he would lay into. And Mick Foley mentions that in his book. And uh, they the, the match you can actually find online as he's Jack Foley, it actually ends with a top rope belly to back superplex, which is insane to see in the 80s. Belly to back superplex. You have to realize how young and inexperienced Mick Foley was at the time. That's not an easy bump to take there. Uh, that's, you know, that's, you know, what, what they were in the past. But in, in the 90s, he gets to wrestle Cactus Jack. Mick is a little more experienced and Tom Billington's own words, they have a very good match. Though he did describe that when Cactus Jack goes to do his classic elbow on the outside, rolls out of the way, and left Mick to just take the entire impact himself. Mick Foley doesn't seem to have any hard feelings about this. Good for him. God, Mick just seems like the nicest sort of guy. Like, I feel like somebody could pour soup into his lap and then he would apologize to them, honestly. (laughs) Mick, we're not talking down on you, man. You're just such a nice guy if you are listening, you know. Right, right, right. You know, everyone loves you. Still, Dynamite Kid at, at this point, he, he and uh, this is the 90s era now, and things, this is sort of the downward spiral of Tom Billington, I hate to say. He's wrestling a lot now in uh, Japan. He's wrestled in Stampede with uh, Johnny Smith as both an opponent and as a tag team partner with him and Davey Boy. And he and Davey Boy are starting to end their agreement as the Bulldogs. At the, uh, around this time, Davey Boy takes off back to the WWF, and he has trademarked the name the British Bulldogs. And right, so he is. Didn't he just become the British Bulldog at that point, though? He did. Yeah. And uh, he showed up and he was huge. And Tom Billington continues to wrestle with uh, Johnny Smith, oftentimes as the British Bruisers, because that's what Johnny Smith had wrestled as. Johnny Smith, by the way, was related to uh, Ted Bentley. He was not related to Davy Boy Smith at all, which is interesting because that's the way they've always presented. Right. And right. He ends up working the Nasty Boys. And <laughs> from his opinion, he didn't think much of them at first. Apparently, this there's some incident where they had all went to a, a sushi bar. The Nasty Boys, if you look up interviews with them, uh, Brian Knobs mentions, hey, we, we just forgot. We were young, we were drunk, and we left a bar tab open. 
and I guess it reflected on Dynamite Kid. And Dynamite had started the match with them. He had looked over to Johnny Smith and he'd said, hey, don't give them nothing, which meaning, you know, meaning don't sell for them. Don't make them look good. Just, you know, just beat on them. And that's what he ended up doing. The match apparently ends where Tom Billington whips Brian Nobbs to the corner. He tells him, hey, stay for the clothesline. And he comes running in and blasts him with a corner clothesline and ends up splitting the guy's lip, you know, giving him a pin. And he said the Nasty Boys were cool about it, though. Maybe they were like Mick Foley. And afterwards, he decided he really liked them. They were good guys. But that's basically how he started ending, you know, All Japan in 91. This is sort of the the end of his uh, his time. He goes to see his father, his own father, before he dies in England, who he has not seen in about 13 years. Uh, he hates Davy Boy Smith now, uh, who's trademarked the name the British Bulldog, so he can't use it himself. He's not working for the WWF. He's not working for All Japan, who were not happy about you know certain incidents like the Nasty Boys and such, though they would have still kept booking him. He just decided he was done there. He's working matches in England. He's doing stuff for Max Crabtree and such again. Davey Boy's done some stuff for the Federation and then went off to WCW. He apparently didn't last long in the Fed and then did some stuff for Crabtree and stuff back in England again. And Dynamite shows up at one of the shows and Smith is not there. So Tom Billington just destroys his merchandise scan, stand, I guess, and, you know, t- talk smack about him and such. Oh, very, very professional. And this is uh, sort of the tail end years for him. He ends up working a couple more matches. The last bout, I believe, was in uh, Mishinoku. Did you know about that? Uh, would that be the uh, attempt to come back match with, in uh, 1996, I believe? Yeah, I guess the idea was they wanted to bring him in to surprise Tiger Mask. And so he works against Tiger Mask. He's tagging with Kuniaki Kobashi and Dos Keras against the original Satoru Sayama as Tiger the great Sasuke, who owns Mishinoku, and Mills Mascarez. And the match itself is okay, but this is pretty much his... You can you can see when he shows up there, he's a shell of the guy he was. He's not been uh, doing the steroids. He's not been... It's, it's years afterwards. He is now just sort of doing it for the money. And he mentions himself that he felt embarrassed afterwards because he knew that at this point it wasn't his work rate anymore. That was getting him hired. It was his just his name. It was that was that was all he had left. Right. And from what I've heard and what I've seen, his ring gear didn't even fit correctly at that point because, I mean, he was obviously off the steroids at that point. He wasn't big enough to really fit even into his tights at one point from what I've heard, which was spandex. So that's kind of hard to swallow at that point. In 97, he's now he's been divorced at this point. He was divorced in 91, I believe, from his Uh, wife. Correct. We can cover that a little bit later. That was. If you guys are still listening, that was, um, you know, more about what the uh, trigger warning was for, for all of you guys that, you know, may be uncomfortable with that, which, hey, no harm, no foul if you're not comfortable with it. By 97, he marries his his new wife, Dot, who apparently, in his own words, didn't know he was a wrestler. He liked that, that that she just met him and, you know, they got along. At that point, he's he's at the end of it. He's he's seeing doctors and such. He's wheelchair bound. He's friends with Dan Spivey still who is also having a lot of problems of his own and this is pretty much i i hate to say it's the end of the man's career you know for all the things that he's done and kind of ties up the end he says that he was proud of a lot of things he did he you know he uh, a five-star match with tiger mask the second one dave Meltzer ever mentioned he's had tag the world tag titles in the wbf and all japan he was the WF Junior Light Heavyweight Champion. Uh, this guy helped Bret Hart get to where he got to. You know, the matches they had were incredible, and he helped shape him and, you know, the rest of the Hart family and the the others at Stampede. Right. The I guy mean, w- he helped train uh, Benoit. He really paved the way for the guys like Guerrero and Liger, and he really was just a cruiserweight legend at that point before it was really popular to be that kind of guy. Uh, absolutely. I mean, as far as that high spot style match, He's the guy who innovated both the superplex and the backdrop superplex. Did some incredible stuff. Right. Innovated and so much. It's incredible to see. Um, if you watch any of his matches, you will see he's very stiff with a lot of the things that he gives, and he's precise with his uh, move set. And something that's very memorable about him, and something that I've only seen him hit the way he does, is his snap suplex. It's oh quick, and it looks like it hits hard. And even Jacques Rougeau said. 
yeah, one second you're standing there, and then the next you're just flipped over him, and you're gone. You just feel it hitting the mat. You just feel your back hit you, and it's like you just didn't expect it, even though you knew it was about to hit you. His snap suplex is incredible, and that's you can see that with Benoit. Uh, Chris Benoit imitates so many maneuvers, and the guy was great. You know, flying headbutt from the top rope. Some of his work rate really transcends what you'd expect at the time. It it became the cornerstone for what you would expect for light heavyweight wrestlers, cruiserweight wrestling, the 205 live kind of divisions. That that sort of, you know, hey, we can wrestle on the top rope. We can do, you know, dives to the outside. Exactly. These are incredible things. Incredible stuff there. On the downside, uh, there, there's a lot of negatives. And this is, uh, I think you and I talked before and I said a little bit of the good, the bad, the ugly. Yep. Yeah. For you guys who are listening Here's what the trigger warning was about. Let's go back to 1991. Let's talk about what we talked a little bit off camera about. So, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, are we going to talk about his wife and the uh, the shotgun? Uh, we're going to talk about the family life and things that just happened, and his daughters remember, his former wife remembers. Mm-hmm. So, we'll start off with this story, guys. 1991, uh, I believe uh, his former wife had said it was New Year's, and he comes home with just a bloody face. And uh, his daughter was just terrified, obviously. I mean, her dad just walked in, faces bleeding. I think any little kid that's, or anybody that would see that would be like, yo, what is going on? And he comes over, he's like, ah, don't worry about it. Daddy fell, it's okay. And uh, his wife's a little nervous, obviously, for good reason. And eventually she starts talking to him and says, hey, what's going on? He's not really being specific. Eventually... It seemed like he had lost his mind during this time. Uh, She tried not to have anybody hurt in the situation, but as she was pregnant with his third child, I believe, Dynamite Kid had an absolute episode, and it seemed like he had lost his mind. There was a point where uh, she had asked him to leave because of the way he was acting and being, and he said, you know what, I think you should leave. He said, or she said, no. You know, I have the kids here. I'm pregnant. I think it would be easier for you to go, and I think you should go back to England. And he told her, you know what? You have 15 minutes to get out and grabbed a shotgun, pointed at her head, and said, I will blow your effing head off. And at that point, she actually called his bluff. She Hmm. just, no, yeah, you're not going to do that. And eventually ended up calling the police, who basically told her, well, he said you can leave. Just leave. So eventually she did follow the direction of the police operator who i think is just wow that has to be one of the worst possible people to be giving you advice at that moment oh (laughs) oh well the gunman says you can leave just go this is my house no right right (laughs) why are you helping me but wow (laughs) yeah there was a little bit more violent things that went on like i guess he had dragged her across the floor by the hair at first and she had been just traumatized at that point but she kept trying to like downplay it for the kids like oh no daddy's having a moment it's okay he'll leave we'll be fine eventually she and the kids left and then he left back to england where he wouldn't be seen for a long time and his daughters hadn't seen him in what felt like forever and then uh, a few years later he got remarried to i believe her name was dot you had said in what yeah. was it 1997 uh-huh Later on down the road, uh, his daughter was oldest one. Uh, I believe her name is Bronwyn. Uh, yeah, she had decided, you know what, I'm going to go and see him just to at least put that effort out there and to try for him. And she claims it was a nice visit. There was even a point where he actually apologized to her for things that he had put the family through and how terrible it was. There's just a lot to that to think about. Like, could you imagine witnessing your own family turning against you like that all over what, you know? Along with this, there is some rumors that he was in some sort of bare knuckle boxing ring of some sort. And jeez, oh, Dan Spivey had talked about it a little bit. I'm not entirely sure how true it is. And from between Tim, you and I, we haven't really found any other substantial evidence besides Spivey kind of hinting and talking about it during the Dark Side of the Ring episode. But it seems like it's possible. Would he have done it? Maybe. But who's to say, really, besides him? And at the end of it all, his wife blamed, or his former wife, I should say, Michelle, blamed the CTE and depression for what could have happened. And 
she doesn't really want people to talk down on him, but more the situation and believes that maybe if there's better concussion protocol and people cared about mental health, that these sort of things wouldn't have happened. But one thing is very surprising and kind of comes to my mind about the whole shotgun incident is, and let's address the elephant in the room, the Benoit incident. Huh. You know, I mean, where this guy said, I'll blow your head off, Benoit actually went through with it, as dark and depressing as that is. I mean, there's other – like I, I did not mention this, but in my research over and over, he keep men- keeps mentioning one of his good friends was also Billy Jack Haynes. Billy Jack Haynes, who's been recently mentioned also in ties to a tragedy involving a shooting involving his own family. I think it's safe to say that loading your body up with incredible amounts of testosterone and giving yourself concussions over and over is probably not a good idea. I can't agree more. And uh, as of, I think, a month or two ago, Billy Jack Haynes was arrested for shooting his wife. Birds of a feather, they flock together. But... There's only I mean, here's there's there's several other things that we did not touch on while we were dis- discussing. There's several wrestlers that mentioned him slipping halcyon, you know, pills and people's drinks to mess with their heads. You know, of course, the honky tonk man, there's an entire bit where the uh, apparently the honky tonk man. Now, this is, of course, we're going to rumors here that the the dynamite kid was friends with uh, the king Harley race. That's what they were calling him at the time in the WWF. Great wrestler, legendary guy, also a very questionable concerning some of the antics. But what, according to Dynamite, he had heard that the Honky Tonk Man had said uh, something about the the you know Harley Race, the King, when he was away because he was having stomach problems, and made a joke. Oh man, I I bet he wishes he had this paycheck that Honky Tonk had just got. And he then says he went and he slapped around uh, Wayne Ferris, you know, beat him up. And the Honky Tonk Man was crying and such. And though if you read anything where the Honky Tonk Man's talking about it, he says it's it didn't quite happen that way. It seems a little, you know, a little bit of an argument whether Dynamite actually attacked him. Uh, well, he he does mention the Dynamite attacked him, but he he doesn't say that you know he went crying and such. <laughs> I wouldn't want to tell people that either. Uh, but he says that um, he never made fun of Harley Race, or if he did, he just laughed at a joke someone else was saying, and it wasn't meant to be. This serious. He he claimed that Bobby he had made some joke and then he laughed and it wasn't supposed to be that serious. And one of the darker things I'd heard was also, did you hear the stuff about John Foley's daughter? John Foley's daughter. Oh, we're getting really deep in the weeds here. I did not know about this. I don't know how legit this is. I like this is the best I could do from you know research. But supposedly John Foley, which was one of his managers in Stampede, if you remember back then, another English. The claim is that Dynamite Kid had broke John Foley's daughter's legs when John Foley had wanted to use her for an insurance claim. Uh, not use her, but she, she had, you know, he'd wanted to get more money from an insurance claim. So he asked Dynamite to break her legs from the knees down. And this is internet rumor. I, I can't tell you for certain, but. Still, given some of the other stories he's told and such, who knows? Who really knows? <laughs> it's it's hard to tell. I'm not trying to blame the guy, but it's it's difficult when you look at this this wrestler who's done so many incredible things for changing work rate itself and changing what people thought was possible. And at the same time, too, there's so many stories of sadism, you know, abuse. Just these horrible things that he's done, and it's like, man... You really kind of went off the deep end there, bud. And yeah. I know that CTE and the drugs definitely played a part in it, but man, that has so many of these bad effects. And like we just mentioned, Benoit and Billy Jack Haynes, these two other guys that most would see them as they had to have gone nuts at that point to be well, doing the things that they did. Dynamite had condemned Benoit's actions afterwards. And that's interesting, saying, you know, oh, man, you, you got you, you to gotta learn how to taper this. You, gotta, you know, you don't take it out on family members and this, that, you know. And I mean, he didn't pull the trigger on his family, but he certainly pointed it at them. It's there's a certain point where you say to yourself, there are fantastic legends throughout and there are, there are fantastic professional wrestlers. But there's a certain point where you say, was he really that much of a professional? But. As far as his impact on 
as far as high flying and high spots and work rate and the the intense you know loads he would do in the ring he is arguably a legend i have to agree he has paved the way for many and at what cost honestly potentially his sanity body can't just go forever and you can't just keep juicing it up hoping for great results and uh i think that's where we'll end this one guys because we went down the dark path we showed you the good the bad and the ugly here it's it's rough knowing what this man did but at the same time it's also great to see what he's done for the profession that he loved so much but on a lighter note so tim it's your first time on the podcast do you have any recommendations for the audience book movie song just something something we do on wrestle magic so uh my recommendation uh i try to read as many books by professional wrestlers as i can my favorite I would have to say uh, Mick Foley's Have a Nice Day, and it's extremely relevant to what we're speaking about now. He talks about working with Dynamite Kid and uh, what his experiences were like there. It's also just a fantastic read, so that's my recommendation. Totally, totally agree, man. And honestly, guys, I don't know how all of you feel about Dark Side of the Ring. I don't know how you guys feel about you know, even what we just did talking about this guy's career, but if I could give a recommendation – that show really does go pretty well in depth. So I will say, if you guys want to know more stuff like this, like I'm pretty sure they went over like the murder of Bruiser Brody and the Ooh. questionable death of uh, Dino Bravo and stuff like that. If you want to know about that kind of stuff, check them out too. I have to give them credit. It's narrated by Chris Jericho, which honestly he's got his own um, controversy kind of going on recently. But he does it very well, and I have to give credit where it's due for also where I'm getting some of my information. And uh, I have to say... It's been a lot of fun here. You guys know where to reach me, at MaintenanceMav on Twitter. Hit me up, especially if you guys know where I got that intro idea from, because I'd like to see who knows where I got that from. But anyways, do something nice for somebody. You never know who needs it. And with that, in the words of Memphis Mark, I'm out.